Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me here again to, um, to talk about diversity in natural landscapes. So what do, what do we mean by that? And I think to help you just to kind of enter into the space where I exist, I want to take you back into some lived experiences um, almost 35, 40 years ago. So on the next slide, you're going to see two pictures, two childhood pictures of, um, you can skip to the next one. Two, two pictures from my childhood. Here you go. There's a picture of my family over at the Isle of Wight. This is the right hand side. And if you know those, if you know the geology there, you'll know that's Alum, Alum Bay. That's my family. I'm right at the end. I'm probably, I don't know, eight years old, something like that. Now, that this is, this is probably like the end of the 70s, early 80s. And our family, um, I'm not sure of what my, my, the adults in my group experience, like there's my grandmother at the front in the sari. But for me, my resounding memory of that holiday was going into a paddling pool. And there's this lovely paddling pool. I think it's up by ride in the shape of the Isle of Wight, going into that paddling pool with my little brother and my sister and seeing other white children being pulled out by their parents. And that, that was really confusing for me because I didn't understand why the children were being pulled out when we went in. And that gives you some kind of indication of what Asian and black families were experiencing you know, 35, 40 years ago, when we were going into these spaces, we were made to feel like we didn't belong. And it just doesn't manifest itself in actions, it manifests itself in words and behaviour. And the other picture is myself and my family over at Hailing Island, and we're having a picnic on the beach, and you can see my, my mother and my grandmother in traditional dress. But the comments that we got, the racism, the feeling that we, we shouldn't be in this space, why are you here? Why don't you go back to where you come from? These are the comments that people like myself, people of colour experience when we go out to green spaces and particularly coastal spaces because they are mostly in rural environments where people like us aren't generally seen enjoying the natural environment. So this is, we're talking about a situation over kind of 30 years ago. So on the next slide, what I wanna kind of bring your focus into is is there are barriers to the way we engage people with these audiences. And a lot of the time, the organizations that make up, um, uh, make up those, uh, organize, uh, the people that make up the organizations that look after the natural environment are predominantly white. And there was a 2017 report um, that actually found that only 0.6% of the workforce employed in the environmental sector were black and Asian. So that gives you some indication of the huge issue we are facing to help an, a predominantly white workforce understand the voices and the needs of diverse communities when they go out into these natural spaces. I currently work for Wessex Museums and I'm running a program looking at how we engage underserved audiences in museum spaces, but the same findings apply to these natural spaces as well. When people of colour go into these spaces, they experience microaggressions, that unconscious bias that, you know, makes you feel like, you know, perhaps, perhaps I am not welcome here, you know, do I actually belong in this space? When we don't see ourselves represented in staff or volunteers working in those uh, organizations, looking after the natural spaces, when the facilities that have been set up don't really kind of um, address our experiences of how we like to enjoy nature, all in all, what that ends up with is, is a kind of unseen barrier which prevents us from enjoying and accessing coastal spaces. So if we skip to the next slide, this is one of the big problems. So I, I talked about my lived experiences 35 years ago. This was an article in the Times that appeared in February 2021. Culturally diverse crowds blamed for seaside litter and vandalism. Now I live in Dorset. I live 20 minutes from Lulworth Cove and Dodor Door. And when this petition came out from the Lulworth estate, I was incensed because I thought if I go to Dodor Door today and somebody sees a piece of litter on the beach, are they going to look at me and think that that is my fault that that, that piece of litter is there? And what this did was it catalyzed action from myself, Gillian Burke, the Ramblers, the National Association for AUNBs, and a bunch of other organizations to write a letter of response back to the Times, stating the fact that we cannot put the blame for littering on beaches at the feet of culturally diverse audiences. This is the kind of culture that 
um, people of colour are walking into when we actually visit natural spaces. And we've really got to work harder to challenge these attitudes. On the next slide, you'll see that what I've proposed here is a systemic change within the sector so we can begin to actually look at the root of attitudes like that and begin to challenge them to create a warm welcome and crucially representation in our organizational staff and volunteers so we can welcome diverse people um, with without that performative action into our blue and green spaces we need to really understand quite deeply what diverse audiences want from those natural spaces and we need to listen to them and bring their voices to our to our tables we need to consider their needs first but that can't happen and until we begin to change the face of the sector we need to champion that inclusive thought leadership from the very top level this is from the trustee and board level all the way down to volunteers that are looking after our coast paths we need to instigate that systemic change quite urgently especially because we know what the pandemic has meant in terms of uh, disparity across our society but you know it's it's not all doom and gloom if we go to my final slide there's this beautiful picture of me and my mother just last Saturday, I took her out on a boat trip that I was doing a commentary for it was a puffin cruise with birds of Pool Harbour. Now my mother's been in lockdown in Slough for over a year and a half she has not really gone into green spaces at all. I took her on this boat trip and honestly I saw her confidence her joy of being out in nature, it was it was so wonderful to see she doesn't know anything about birds she's not a birder she's not a great walker in in natural landscapes unless i take her there and um, this is my daughter she is the future generation that we need to help engage with nature and what we want to say is you are welcome in these spaces you do belong here and we will help you and we will aid you and listen to you in order for you to be part of this wonderful community um, so you can enjoy nature like everybody else thank you so much i don't know if i'm supposed to be introducing the next speaker but i will the next speaker is, is a story, a pre-recorded story from Caroline, and she's going to be talking about equity of access, but from the perspective of mental health. So if we could play that video, please, that would be marvellous. When I'm on the coast path, I just feel totally alive. Every season is different. Every day is different. The little things that you might see along the path might really inspire you in ways that you never imagined. It felt really important to me to give back to the Southwest Coast Path Association because they provide me with this ability to go and do this amazing walk, to have this amazing adventure and journey. It is an amazing thing to have in your life. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm David Morris. I'm a trustee of the Path Association. I've got a professional background in mental health, social inclusion and connected communities. Um, the value of the path for health, well-being and mental health, as we've just heard, and perhaps recovery from mental health issues, they're all very clear. Um, we want to ensure as an association that the value of the path in this respect is maximised for the benefit of all the diverse groups and individual members of our walking community inclusively, giving people the best possible access, not just to the solace and the solitude that the path provides, but to the support and social solidarity that it affords us. We're very pleased and excited to have established a collaboration with Devon Mind to help to ensure that we advance these goals together. And I'm pleased this afternoon to be able to introduce to you Olivia Craig, uh, Chief Executive Officer of Devon Mind, who will say a little bit more about our collaboration. Thank you very much for being here on our forum today. Thank you, David. I don't know if I need to turn my video on. Probably not. Um, 
but it's uh, yeah, thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. And just to say to Anjana, that was really, really interesting. I um, started my career as a geologist and I am married to a geologist. And when I was talking to him about this event, he, he, he did mention that um, he, he, he knew of you. So it's great. Um, I'm the chief executive of Devon Mind. We are a local mental health charity. We are one of 123 local mines in England and Wales. We're all independent charities in our own right, but we are part of the National Mind Federation, which is a wonderful national charity in its own right. And I was particularly really very interested and excited about our collaboration with the Southwest Coastal Path, particularly because I have an interest in recovery from mental health that isn't just confined to four walls in a room and a desk and two chairs, which is often how we see recovery from mental health. It's how our, our services are set up. It's, it's how we access support. Um, and we do know that the pandemic has created probably a massive increase in mental health issues, mental health need, particularly among cohorts that may not have been at risk before. Our services are stretched, um, health budgets are finite, and we will come to a point where there is an incredible bottleneck in how we can support people who need that support. So I'm really interested in how being in the outdoors, how connecting with the outdoors can help people to self-care and to self-manage and, and stay well with their mental health with the support of organizations like ours in the Southwest Coastal Path. And in 2018, we ran a project in particular with the Tectona Trust, which is a beautiful old wooden sailboat. And we had seven um, members of our recovery college uh, service user team who had severe and enduring mental health issues. And they went and sailed this boat for seven days and have connected ever since with the sea. So very excited about where we can take this with the Southwest Coastal Path and looking forward to getting out there and experiencing the path with colleagues and friends also. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the forum. Hello, I came from uh, Lebanon. I'm from Ethiopia, it's in East Africa. Come from Kuwait. I came here a year ago. It's about one year and three months. Uh, it helped me in uh, knowing new people and communicate with uh, another cultures and traditions. Everything is best, to be honest. The first thing is coming out from a house, you know, getting a purpose to go out is really important for me. And the other thing is meeting new people is always nice. Uh, you need to have a friend here because, as I told you, I'm far away from home. And the other thing is always nice to explore and then to see different places you know it's good thing that you do every day hello hello i'm alex turner um i work for I'm project coordinator for the Southwest Coast Path Association. I'm hoping you can see me because I can't see myself at the moment. Um, I'm just going to tell you a few of the projects that we're doing at the moment that hopefully are trying to address some of the issues that Anne Jenna and um, Olivia have talked about. Next slide, please. So this project, we are working in Plymouth with Devon and Cornwall Refugee Support. Uh, we're running photo walks with them um, in association with an organisation called Photo Now, who do the photo training and we do the walk leading. Um, these projects are really good in terms of familiarising new people to Plymouth um, about where they can go and visit, where um, providing them social activities that they can do. Um, and we travel to all our places by public transport just so that people can um, can go and visit those places when you when they um, at other times. And as you can see from that video, they're really important and people have really appreciated them. Next slide, please. We're continuing our Connecting Actively to Nature project. Um, this photo shows some participants, again from Plymouth, um, out enjoying Mount Edgecombe. Um, these projects, we're in the third year of them now, and they're all about encouraging people to come more active, by introducing them to um, green spaces. And this project's been really interesting in particular because we've had lots of people that are visiting places that they've never been to before, even when they've been in, lived in Plymouth all 
their lives. Um, and thank you on, for this project. We've got some really good support from our path reps, in particular, Dave and John, who've come out with the, this group in particular. Thank you. Next slide, please. And this is the last project I wanted to talk about. And again, we've got some great support from two of our path reps on this project. So there's Tino and Hayden that are in that picture. Um, we're looking at our easy access walks and we're looking at what information we provide to people about how to go out and access the coast path. So it might be disabled people like, uh, like the people in this picture. Um, these are our disabled ramblers. Um, we're at start point, uh, but it might also be about how we can provide information for people with push chairs or just people um, that have more mobility, that have a bit mobility issues or are less confident and what information they need to go out and experience the coast path. 